cataractcoach.com podcast series, episode number 32 with Dr. Kevin Waltz. Dr. Waltz is an ophthalmologist and optometrist who's done a lot of work in the development of the products that we use every week during surgery. From femtosecond lasers to new IOL designs, devices for surgery, he's been at the forefront. And the way he does it is very interesting. He runs charity clinics in Central America. We talk about his work in Honduras and in El Salvador, how he cares for that population. And he does well by doing good, doing good in the world and helping these patients, but also being able to enroll them in studies for these new products. I think you'll really enjoy his podcast and you'll learn a lot. Now, he did have a little bit of an unstable internet connection, so there are a couple of spots where it cuts out a little bit, but that does not detract from this amazing podcast. Check it out. Welcome back to the Cataract Coach Podcast. Today, we have Dr. Kevin Waltz, who's been really innovative in so many different aspects in ophthalmology, in particular, the things you use in the operating room on almost weekly basis. And so we'll talk to him about that. Plus, he has an interesting path in ophthalmology, actually optometry first. And then on top of that, he has some amazing work that he's doing in Central America. So Kevin, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me, Uday. Yeah, so tell us about your path in ophthalmology and optometry and how did, how did you get, get here today? Yeah, it's a long story. I'll, uh, I'll edit it a bit. Sure. Um, I graduated from optometry school in 1981, so 42 years ago. And in, as part of the process, realized that I was going to want to do something else besides optometry and ended up going to medical school starting in 83. And like a lot of people that went to optometry school and then uh, went to ophthalmology, uh, the plan was to become an ophthalmologist. And, and you may know there's actually quite a few uh, people that went to optometry school and then went into ophthalmology. At, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, four of five presidents of the academy had graduated from optometry school. Wow. They didn't talk about it, so they don't use the ODMD like I did. Um, but they, uh, Mel Rubin um, was one. Um, and there were a whole series of people that most people aren't aware of, but there's about 300, 400 people that went to optometry school that went to ophthalmology. So it's actually a well-described pathway. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, to give you an idea how long ago I graduated from ophthalmology residency, it was 1991. And I was a fairly adventurous resident. This is not surprising knowing my um, path afterwards, but well, I had a good friend who was a uh, IOL rep in Florida at the time, and he came to me with a whispered conspiratorial offer. He said, Kevin, we've got foldable lenses. You don't have to put in PMMA lenses anymore. You want to put in some foldable lenses? I said, no, nah, that's crazy. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to stick with my <laughs> PMA lenses. And that was the spring of 1991. So how wow. much have things changed since then? Yeah, tremendous amount. And so uh, just within a few years, I switched all foldable lenses. Um, and, you know, like a lot of things, uh, there was an opportunity to make lemonade out of lemons. In 98, all of a sudden, I started having vision problems. And I ended up relatively quickly needing cataract surgery. So I had cataract surgery April 1st of 98 with the array multifocal lens and it was the first approved multifocal lens and we think i was the first ophthalmologist that had a multifocal lens and i was interested in not having to wear glasses any longer because i had done it for decades already it's like well i'm already having to go through cataract surgery let's explore that and so later that summer i had my second eye done and that caused me to get into ophthalmology research. Um, AMO asked me to get involved in research fairly quickly after that. And so I've spent the last literally 25 years um, doing ophthalmology research to explain how the heck that all happened. 
Wow. And so it's been a very interesting journey. I can appreciate the anxiety of the patient as well as the excitement of the ophthalmologist because I've been both places. And once you have the opportunity to be a patient, it really clarifies things for you. We, um, my partner in, in 98, Mike Orr, and he's an amazing surgeon and he's a great guy. He had the best pre-op ever. So here I am, a 41-year-old, otherwise healthy ophthalmologist having cataract surgery. My career could be over next week. Sure. And he said, if it does work, you're going to be the best paid medical ophthalmologist in the state. And it's like, okay, that covers all bases for me. I can take care of my family. I can have a career. and Let's do it. And, of course, it worked. But he got to the heart of the matter in a very straightforward way way that you normally couldn't do with a patient but with me it made sense yeah of course because you already know everything about it you do the surgery for goodness sakes right yeah 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 um and you know it also at the 90s was a time of topical anesthesia mm -hmm. so i was amazed at the incredible experience it was having cataract surgery with the patient i mean you can see the knives you can see the facets on the knives you can see the capsulotomy forcep tearing the edge of the capsule. You can see it all because your angular magnification is enormous because you're inside the eye. Right. So on my second eye, I said, I don't want to have any drugs. I just want to experience the surgery. So on my second eye, I had topical anesthetic only, and I just watched. And I wasn't afraid anymore. And it was really quite an experience. It helped me tremendously being a doc. And so that was a real positive out of a real negative. Well, tell us more, because obviously, like you, I've done thousands of cataracts, but unlike you, I've never experienced it. I'm still a fake -ic. So yeah. I, what is it that the patient sees? So you had no IV anesthesia for the second eye, just some no. topical anesthetic. So you were fully alert in the way. So what was it like? You can feel the pressure of the forceps against your sclera. It's not uncomfortable, okay. but there's pressure there. You can, uh, we used uh, uh, 3D diamond blades by Ryan at the time. You can see the eye just being distorted ever so slightly by the pressure of the diamond blade. Huh. Because it's not a perfect cut. There's a, there's a slight resistance, not much. And as soon as the resistance breaks and you slide in, you see the eye relax back and that shape go away that was caused by it. Then you see the blade inside of your eye, and there's an incredible light on the other side. So it's like, you know, we, we go to buy a diamond ring for somebody. First thing they do is put you under the spotlight because they yeah, want it to shine. Sure. Well, guess yeah. what? Your microscope's a hell of a spotlight. So yeah. you can see the facets. You can see with the Rhine 3D, they were different front and back. You could see that. I could see clearly... Uh, it wasn't in focus exactly, but it was so large, I could see it quite well. You could see little dust particles on the the diamond blade. Uh, you know, I was looking for them at that point. Sure. Um, I've got viscoelastic in the eye. Well, I can see the viscoelastic start to seep out of the eye because there's an eddy that happens because there's a little bit of back pressure on your sclera. The... Mm -hmm. um, the viscoelastic is moving out of the eye. I can see that and going, he's going to have to put some more viscoelastic in the eye because he's got to do the capsulotomy. And sure enough, he put some more viscoelastic in the eye. So you could, once you knew the surgery, once you're, you weren't sedated, it was like, it all made sense. Do you lose the view after hydro dissection? No. No, you see oh. the, uh, the, the nuclear fraction, you see the pieces come out. What, changes is as the nuclear pieces come out the amount of light that gets into your eye increases pretty dramatically so mm. your retina starts to um blanch at that point so you get a little bit less but when you put the iol in there's really sharp edges that you're seeing because of the difference in refractive index so you can see the 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 we use the, of course an array so you've got a three-piece silicone you can see it coming through the shooter quite well. You can see it unfold and it kind of snaps in place. And there's a secondary snap when you put the uh, 
uh, trailing haptic in the bag. You can also see how inflated the eye is because you've got wrinkles of the posterior capsule, of course, from your three-piece IOL. Mm -hmm. So when the, you're doing irrigation aspiration, you fully inflated the bag, you can see that, and so you can tell what the pressure is. You also can feel when the, you pressurize. So one of the things that people don't appreciate as surgeons is the patient doesn't feel pain because you've given them essentially anesthetic, but you haven't changed their proprioception. Uh, it feels sure. the pop of the pressure. And it scares the crap out of them because they're going, that ought to hurt. Why didn't that hurt? And so you're thinking it's going to hurt, but it didn't. So what you learn when you're watching a surgeon is you have to control the proprioception as much as you have to control the pain. So the way to control proprioception is with narcotics. So a little bit of narcotic goes a huge long way in controlling the proprioception. So we give sedation to control their anxiety, but what really helps you is not the pain of the narcotic, but the you, it blocks the proprioception. Because every time you put that phaco handpiece in the eye and you inflate it, you feel this rigid boom. There's a pressure wave that hits mm, got 360 it, yeah. degrees in every direction on the eye, and you feel it. it's like, oh. And so a little bit of voice before you hit them with the pressure and a little bit of narcotic in the IV helps tremendously with our vocal local. And I learned so all that what, from being a patient. That's amazing. So what narcotics are you doing now? Like a little midazolam, benzodiazepine? Are you doing a little bit of an opioid, like a little fentanyl? Uh, the, I, I like midazolam uh, so that for anxiety, but uh, fentanyl for the narcotic and for the proprioception. So, you know, it's just the same as the um, when you go to the dentist. Sure. What disturbs you at the dentist is you, your face feels all weird and out of shape. Right. Because the proprioception happens from thickly myelinated nerve fibers that you can't block with the local. Same as in the eye. So the way to, to take care of that is a little bit of narcotic ahead of time, which we don't usually bother with with, with uh, dental. But if you are bothered by dental work, typically it's the proprioception that messes you up and a little bit of narcotic fixes that. So interesting. Wow, so many lessons learned so early in your career by just being a patient. Just sitting there and going, wow, I knew it. Holy cow, I did this to 20 patients yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so you were saying you worked first initially with AMO, who, uh, which is uh, Advanced Medical Optics, then became Abbott Medical Optics, then became J&J. Yes. So. And so now it's you know pretty much everybody in the industry I work with in Central America it's blossomed from kind of a one-off, hey, do us a favor, to it's become uh, a way of life, is I learned that I really liked the challenge of research. Sure. What's great about research is there's no BS. There's no way to hide. You either did it or you didn't. And it's very rewarding because part of it is you get judged against your peers. Ophthalmologists, sure. most ophthalmologists don't like to be judged because it's hard on your ego. Because no matter who you are, sometimes you're going to be judged as wanting. But if you're not judged, you don't know how to get better. So research provided an avenue for me to metric myself against other very good peers to drive myself forward. And purely by happenstance, parallel with my research career in the U.S., I started doing hardcore charity work in Central America. Um, I have traveled the world, you know, to provide my services for 30 years now. But I started in Central America in 97. And it was hard. It was the hardest surgery I'd ever done in my life. Why is I that? Would go because the cataracts were just ferocious, okay. uh, especially back in 97. They've gotten much less bothersome since then because myself and a lot of people have been working at this project for decades. But I wasn't prepared for it. I was an American-trained surgeon who had incredible technology and soft cataracts. Sure. 
And so all of a sudden I had crappy technology and ferocious cataracts. Mm -hmm. The very first patient with a cataract I saw in Honduras, I'll never forget. I saw her. We were in a fairly remote area. And um, I was with an optometric ophthalmology team. The optometrists were sending in patients that they couldn't refract. So this lady comes in. She's late middle age and said, here's your first patient. So I get out my pin light because that's a technology I've got. I look at her. I got black <laughs> pupils. Oh, boy. And I'm going, I don't see the cataract. And, you know, I'm an American surgeon. I'm not paying attention. So I send her away. I literally said, I, we can't help you. And so she accepts that. And she's walking out of the room. But in order for her to navigate the room, she has to walk by the wall because her fingernails are against the wall so she can tell where the hell she is in the room. Wow. And I said, let me take another look. And her cataracts were black body absorbers. They didn't allow any light to reflect back from them. She had black marbles in both eyes. So like cataract, cataract and nigrans. Exactly. And so I said, oh, shoot. Okay, well, we're going to do this. And in order to get hers out, I tried FACO. It, that was a joke. Wouldn't work. So I went to an extra cap, and I had to make a 14-millimeter diameter <laughs> hole in the sclera, and then I had to put relaxing incisions in it to get the, the black cataract out. Wow. Once I got it out on the table, I've now got it on a stainless steel mayo, and I've got a 15 barred Parker blade on a hand. I can't cut it. Wow, it really is a marble. It's really a marble. I couldn't, I couldn't even score it. It was a black marble that I was, it was a joke to try to do anything to it. I said, I'm out of my element here. I've got a problem. I came with the wrong technology. <laughs> you brought a knife to a, to a gunfight. Exactly. And so it was hard to accept, but I said, you know, there's lessons to be learned here. If the patients will allow me, I'm going to learn, I'm going to get better, and we're going to take care of them. So I've spent 25 years in Central America doing that. And even today, we routinely bring good, experienced surgeons to Honduras, and they'll leave in tears because it's so crashing to your ego that you can't, with the technology that you've been so successful at in another world, you can't apply it here effectively. Right. And so we tell them up front it's going to happen and said, you know, it happened to us. It may happen to you. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. But it's one of the things that's true about research is also is you sometimes you put in, spend hundreds of millions of dollars on a project and it fails because it's hard to improve what we've got. Right. And so you have to have the ego to handle failure and deal with that. Same thing happens on an individual level when a surgeon comes to Central America. You have to allow your ego the opportunity to fail without shattering it. And it's such a great lesson for a U.S. surgeon because U.S. surgeons, like yourself, Uday, you've been an amazing success your whole life. Everything you've done from high school to college to professional, it's amazing. But even you, I'm sure, has got a few things that you don't really like thinking about, but things didn't go quite as well as you wanted. Of and course. your mom and dad have to create you in such a way that you can handle that. And the more you go through that, the stronger you get. For sure. So in that population now, what percent of the cases are you going to do like FACO? And what percent will you do MSICS or manual small incision cataract, you know, uh, basically a modern version of extra cap? Um, now it's about 80% FACO and 20%, maybe 10% extra cap. We can predict pretty accurately if we're going to need to convert. And it's actually a non-event if we convert. It's, I've gotten so good at doing extra cap, it's not a big deal. I, I don't worry sure. about it anymore. So one of the challenges for a modern American surgeon that's graduating these days, you know, you and I had to do learn extra cap. So I started right. out with a pretty good basis and got better over years. 
I've taken people to Honduras that have never done an extra cap. So You're right. You know, that's like having a no vitrectomy backup. You know, you're you're really out there on a branch. And right. so you just need to have the skills to do what to do in that environment. Right. I think when I finished residency in the year 2000, we were required to do 10 extra caps prior to advancing to FACO. But that I used, I was was teaching residents for 22 years up until last year when I retired from it. But residents no longer for the last 10 years, maybe even 15 years, do any extra caps. So I made it a point when we were at the county hospital and the patients who came in with those absolute dense brunescent rocks, we're gonna do MSICS, the, you know, the more modern version of, a, of an extra cap. So at least they had some experience in doing it. But you're right, most programs across the country, there's zero experience. And it's such a good procedure in the right setting. You know, There was a great trial done with um, the uh, Himalayan Cataract Project and David Chang years ago. This was done probably the late 90s. Uh, Sanduk Ryut had, uh, and David Chang had a competition. So in Nepal, they had a long line of patients. In one room was David Chang with a modern generation FACO. In another room was a guy doing extra cap. And it was, okay, Heads, you go here, tails, you go there. They just alternated. And the extra caps turned out better than David Chang on his best day. For sure. That's because amazing. It was so hard to do FACO on those cataracts. Now, they right. said in about a year they were equivalent. But, you know, that's not what we think of. We think of the extra cap catching up to the FACO uh, after a year. In this case, the the FACO caught up to the extra cap after a year. Right. And it's just related to applying the right technology to the right problem. Right. If you have a three plus NS cataract, three plus nuclear sclerosis, I think FACO is going to win every time. If you have a soft PSC cataract, of course FACO. But yeah, once you get beyond four plus NS and you get those brunettes and the root beard type dense, dense cataracts or like your patient, a black cataract. Yeah, the manual extraction is so much easier. I actually still use MSICS and every year in Beverly Hills in our private surgery center, I'll see a couple of patients that actually I decide would do better with that procedure. And we still do it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that was interesting for me is my ego got beat up pretty hard about not being as good as extra cap. So I was driving to go to 100% FACO in Honduras. And I realized... Mm. That's a misapplication of technology. Right. The patients do better if I get good at extra cap and I define which one I'm going to do ahead of time. And right. I think it's true in the U.S. We have the same question that we use as docs is, well, which lens for this patient? You know, not every patient gets the same lens. Not every patient gets the same treatment of their astigmatism. It's depending on what What's the problem for this patient is how best to solve it. All right. Tailoring the surgery to the patient obviously makes the most sense. Yeah, for our listeners, if you want to learn MSICS or modern version of extra cap, of course, there are a ton of videos on it on cataractcoach.com. I've got it all simplified. So if you're a FACO surgeon, really, you owe it to yourself to learn this. Absolutely. Really and I want to put in a... A plug for cataractcoach.com. I think the service that you're doing for humanity by way of the service you're doing for ophthalmology is amazing. Good day. You know, one uh, of the things you. that I use cataractcoach.com is I do custom training of surgeons in Central America, and our number one tool is cataractcoach.com. You've got a full set of tools nicely packaged so we can go and go, here's your 10 videos this week. Look at them, look at them again, we'll talk next week. Fantastic. And it's so powerful, all of the tools that you've created to show here's what you do, here's what you worry about, and so on and so forth. It's been a huge benefit for me teaching lots of people uh, with the technology you've created. So thank you. Oh, that's such an honor for me. Yeah, I actually now have a full curriculum series too on Cataract Coach. If you go to the main website, the top right corner will be, I think, for curriculum. The curriculum is 25 lessons, each about 30 to 40 minutes, fully narrated. 
and stepwise, like how to prepare to go to the opera room, how to set up your machine, how to set up your microscope, ergonomics, how to do an how to do different types of anesthesia for a patient. And it goes through every step of the entire thing. And if you do one lesson a week, that's about six months worth. If you do one every other week, that's about a year's worth. And then I also have now free cataract coach book that you can download on there. It's about a hundred pages PDF book. It's also totally free. And it's amazing. We now have more than 20 million views and 56,000 subscribers. So it's like, I can't even believe it got this big. My, my hat's off to you because it's, it's so comprehensive. You know, it's, it's almost one-stop shopping. We're try, trying our best now. And our new thing is, of course, our podcast series here. So tell me, Kevin, when you're in South America, or Central America, you have a lot of opportunity to help companies kind of develop and do these trials for new technologies. What are some of the technologies that you really enjoyed working with and developing there? Well, um, it happened, we got involved in research because companies were having some log jams in the US. So they would come to me and ask, hey, can you help us with this, that, or the other thing? I actually put in the first IC8 with AccuFocus in Honduras back oh, wow. in 2008 or so. We very quickly realized that the cornea inlay worked, but there were some challenges in the cornea. If we put it in an IOL, there weren't. The company mm -hmm. had a hard time wrapping their arms around that. So actually, John Vukic and I had a made up 20 custom made uh, silicone um, IC8s. They were you know, the precursor to IC8. And we implanted them in Honduras. And it was uh, really a great learning opportunity. The patients loved it. And we've gone back to that well many times. Um, so the IC8 was the first one. Um, we did some Pimto research early on in Honduras. One of the challenges with that is people don't realize how stable the electrical system is in the U.S. You mm -hmm. In the U.S., if you want a Pimto, you just have the correct plug, you plug it in the wall, and away you go. But the Pimtos are fairly particularly lasers. When we wanted to do... Uh, research on Fento in, the U in Honduras, we had to take the clinic entirely off the grid, rewire the systems up to oh, US wow. standards, and put it on a generator. Wow. And then it run it through multiple UPSs to make sure it was exactly the kind of energy that you wanted the laser to see. So we actually had a, the only time it's ever been done, we had a custom modified intralase for corneal work. We modified it to do uh, lens work, and we knocked out 19 capsulotomies and uh, captures. I mean, uh, nuclear softening in Honduras, and showed you can make an intralase work in the lens. Ultimately, um, AMO decided not to pursue that commercially, but it gives you an idea of kind of the depth of what we've done there. Um, we've got um, very interesting drug technology. So there's a guy that's an ophthalmologist who's 92 years old now, uh, Vernon Wong, who's created an amazing amount of extended release formulations for ophthalmology over the last 30 years. They've got uh, a delivery system that, it, you know, if you're... probably a similar amount for antibiotic and maybe use a non steroidal So you've got hundreds of eye drops for each eye post-op. His extended for release formulation, you can put all those eye drops into three drops. One the day of surgery, one the day of after surgery, and one a week later, you're done. No drops for the patients. Wow. So we've done that research in Central America and shown that it's possible. And what's interesting is that's a challenging thing for drugs because Central American eyes are smaller. They're more pigmented. They're more likely to have trauma and the cataracts are worse. So you can, if you can make it on work on those patients in the U.S., you can make it work on your blue-eyed patients all day long. All right. But what really got 
us involved heavily into research and off, got me to walk away from my practice in the U.S. because I realized this was going to be become a almost full time job. Was the Symphony Project? So we, I was the lead uh, study site in the U.S. for AMO, and they're doing a extended review of a new kind of IOL, which we're going to call extended depth of focus. So it was first try at making an extended depth of focus lens. So it was really difficult to do the surgery because it had to be done just so, and yet the follow-up was quite difficult. So AMO was using their three top sites in Germany to do the protocol. They had a three-part protocol. Each part was going to take three years. So the whole thing was going to take nine years. This was the prep for the FDA trial. <laughs> and so the AMOs about halfway through the second part and said, this is ridiculous. We can't afford to do this. The market needs it faster, yada, yada, yada. So we did the second half of the trial, the second half of the second trial in Honduras in February, March of 2012. Done, mm -hmm. like nine weeks. They gave us the third part of the trial later that year, which we did in nine weeks. And so at the end of the day, the team that did that for AMO, which was Abbott Medical at the time, won the Research Year of the War Year Award at a $60 billion pharmaceutical company because we took the product to market, they estimated two years faster than they could anywhere else in the world by going to Central America. During those two years, they sold almost $300 million worth of product. And we all remember the big bang the symphony was clinically. That happened in the U.S. The U.S. doctors had that opportunity because of Honduras. Wow. Now, what was interesting what is there were about four years there where you couldn't buy it in the U.S. because it didn't get approved in 2016. But we had Hondurans walking around without glasses doing just fine. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, well, it shows you how long things take to get approved. So when you do like the initial um, small aperture IOLs, the ones you made up with Vukic, and to have it finally, finally this year, we got them in our hands, FDA approved in the USA. I mean, it takes a long time. It's a really, it's a lot of hard work. And you, there's a lot of opportunity to fail along the way. So you have to be really good at what you do and consistent. We're working on a couple of great projects now. Uh, we've got an accommodated lens that actually works. Cool. Um, you know, depending on how you measure it, what you think is real, we're probably getting four to six doctors of accommodation. What we're getting is a patient that can see 2016 at distance and can come up to 2020 at near at about 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters. Wow. Very close. Amazing. Yeah, very close. And I've got good near vision, but I can't see that well up close. So I have to take a video of it and enlarge my video to see what they're seeing. <laughs> wow. So we're, we're doing well with that. We've got which another... company is which company is that, and what's the mode of action? Um, it's called the Jealousy IOL. Um, it um, it was created by a guy that's you know an optical genius. He's actually a pediatric ophthalmologist who doesn't do cataract surgery, but he's a former Guyton fellow, so he's an optics guru. Mm -hmm. And he created a couple of concepts about you know what we were missing in prior accommodating lenses. And they appear to be cr true. Um, so we're we're prosecuting that one uh, really hard at the moment. Uh, we've got another device that I just love. It's called the VLAs. It's a femtosecond laser. The original project for femtosecond laser for ophthalmology was run by a guy named Tibor Jahaz. And it was going to be glaucoma. Mm. And they couldn't figure out how to do it with technology at the time back in the 90s. So second choice was either cataracts or refractive. They did refractive. And it became intralase. So then the group that did intralase did LensX for cataracts. Now they're doing VLAs for glaucoma. So uh, we're their main site in uh, Honduras uh, doing the clinical trials for the FDA study. 
And so what's nice about it is it does not penetrate the eye except for the laser light. So you just do a standard femto dock against it and it treats your glaucoma. It doesn't eliminate it, but it goes a long way toward making the glaucoma not an issue without actually putting the eye at any significant risk. So, so where's the, the laser that is going in the trabecular meshwork then? Yep. But currently, there's a box that's cut out of the trabecular meshwork by the laser. So it, we're currently working on the ideal shape and number. But we've got approximately 30 different treatment sites, 360 degrees in the trabecular meshwork. We'll go in, we cut the trabecular meshwork out, essentially unroof Slim's canal. And the opening you put in it is long enough and deep enough that you typically get um, a collector channel involved and you get a very nice reduction in pressure, no pressure spikes. And it's a relatively uh, high tech procedure because, you know, as a good surgeon, what do you figure you are plus or minus in terms of accuracy of your incision? 100 microns? Sure. And this, this is 10 times better. Exactly. We, we are dialing in in two or three micron increments to go, eh, we want a little bit deeper. Let's move it a little left. Oh, that, that's it right there. And so we've got OCT driven guidance. We've got an OCT, uh, a, a femto treatment, and we just push the button. Wow. Amazing. So all of those things are just a few years away that, you know, and what's fun is as part of all this trial, we've convinced U.S. companies it's okay to come to Central America and do these trials, but we have to leave some of the gold in Central America for the population. So the local governments have bought onto that, so they allow us to operate on um, vulnerable populations. In the U.S., you know, you can't do research on somebody that's considered a vulnerable population without special permission, a child, a prisoner, or something like that. Sure. But that includes people that can't afford your surgery. Well, that's everybody you see in Central America. So we had a good conversation with the local government said, here's what we want to do. We'll take care of everybody's eye problem that comes to us, whichever. We'll offer them eye surgery research if they want. They don't have to take it. We'll take care of them regardless. But we need your permission to operate on them and support us in that process. Audit us as much as you want. But we're going to get looked at by international agencies. We want you to be sure that you can back us up. And so we have this nice symbiotic relationship. We're taking care of their population. And we're providing the data for the companies in a way that's safe and, and uh, uh, monitored uh, and uh, kind of vetted so that it's um, an acceptable way to do it in that environment. Wow. So you, you, get to, you do well by doing good exactly and so most of our research patients are charity patients but instead of the patient paying for it the companies pay for it but then they judge our work very harshly because they've got to be judged by whoever the fda or or whoever that might be and so we have to teach the local docs to do this to an exceptionally high level and then they take that same knowledge to their average patients that they take care of. So, you know, in a good year, I could do 50 cases a week uh, teaching surgeons um, in Honduras in the past. We're up to now we do several thousand cases a year and growing fast. And the results are comparable to any top group in the world. You know, we get amazing results um because that's what we have to have and so they know they're getting judged with that but there's a value to getting judged because then they have a reward wow tell me more project now you know you were also involved with the centricity and zepto that's all started with you as well didn't it yep i did the first uh zepto in el salvador in about 2015 2016 we did a rapid iteration where we changed the Zepto, redesign it every, and remanufacture it every two months and go back and do more cases so that we were ready for an FDA trial when we got FDA approval in 2017. Um, and 
it was a very interesting process that we were able, with the support of local government, the support of the local practices, we created a model that nobody had ever done before that I just love that uh, we went to our employees. We said, we're going to do research. And this is our employees in El Salvador. We're going to do research. We're going to need a lot of patients. How do we find the patients and take care of them? And they suggested, said, well, we have all these relatives that live an hour or two away, but there's no eye doctor within sight. So if you can help them, they'll come here and we can do whatever we need to do. And so we went to the government and said, you don't have anybody out here taking care of these people. We'll provide the transportation to come in. We'll feed them for the time that they're in the city. We'll take care of them. We'll send them back. And you can audit us all you want. And then the government agreed to it. And then we talked to the local priests and said, you know who these patients are. We need you to refer your parishioners who need eye care to us. We'll transport them to the city. We'll take care of them, whatever it takes. Some of them will get research. Some of them will get drops. Some of them will get standard eye care, whatever it takes. All we ask is at the end of the trial, if you're satisfied, you refer us to the next village and we take care of their patients. Wow. So at the end of the first trial, we taken care of most of the people at that village. And the villagers told the priest, they said, we're going to do a mass for, at the time, it was Minosis. Because there were a lot of blind people in our village until they came here. There's no more blind people in our village. We're, you're going to do a mass for us and them. So traditionally, when we finish with the village, the, the village is doing a mass to say their appreciation for the U.S. company that helped them. And they recognize that. And, you know, it, it was quite gratifying that that happened. We're on village now, eight or nine. I don't remember which one. But we, it's the, one of the offshoots of that is our follow-up is almost perfect. Right. Because it's a group follow-up. If everybody gets in the bus and Mabel's not in the bus, they go, where's Mabel? Mm -hmm. and let's go to her house. Let's get her. She's late. So they all come as one, so they all come. So the number one complaint we had from the U.S. companies was, your follow-up's not that good, you're lying. There's no way it's that good. We've never seen it that good before. Prove to us that it's that good. And so we showed them the process and explained it to them and said, okay, you win. And so we got audited because people didn't believe our follow-up. They didn't have any complaints about our outcomes but they didn't believe you could get patients to show up with that regularity in Central America. Right, because even if you do a trial in the US, you have to follow the patient's post-op and you have some attrition there. So if you're good, maybe 90% of the patients will come to all the post-op visits. But often now there's much less than that, but you're probably coming on 100%. It's close to it. We, it's, we have to explain why it's not 100% to ourselves. Yeah. Because, you know, part of it is we're providing a great service for the patient. We're respectful of them. You know how it is where the patient, it, they, number one, they get cleaned up. They put on their nice dress because they're going to so see the cute, uh, you know, uh, American doctor who's, you know, 20 years younger. And mm -hmm. the American doctor is going to be solicitous of them. So we treat them well. We feed them. We send a car to their house. We bring them to the big city. The reputation of the clinic we work with is very good locally. They're great docs. And the population knows they probably can't afford surgery here, but they're getting the best we have to offer. And so they respond in kind. And it's, it's, yeah. quite, it's quite nice. So you have now multiple sites then. You talked about the work in Honduras and now also El Salvador. That's right. We've, got, we've been doing research in Honduras uh, I had a previous partner that I had to walk away from. There was some ethical issues that I couldn't tolerate. Sure. Um, and so that happened. I walked away in 2015, 2014, and I started with a new group in 2016 in Honduras. And I've been working with a group in El Salvador. 
uh, since about 2015. And I've become kind of their gringo uncle. Uh, <laughs> you know, they have kids. Um, and I'm, I have a relationship with the kids and relationship with the, the younger docs. And we have a very interesting opportunity to learn about each other. And sure. one of the things that's interesting is how amazing a family could be in that environment. So it, they're typically multi-generational and they don't have the same resources and opportunities we have in the US, but they make the most of what they have. And it's just, it's just really, really encouraging for humanity. For instance, our group in uh, Honduras is the Robleses. Mom and dad, Hector and Lourdes, Hector's an ophthalmologist, Lourdes is a uh, family practice. They're semi-retired now. They had three kids, Marco, who's our anterior segment surgeon, Pablo, who's our retinal surgeon, and Annie, who's just finished up residency in Germany. So they raised three ophthalmologists in a resource-deprived country. Wow. What family do you know that raised three ophthalmologists in the U.S.? And it's mm, difficult. Yes. It's, they live in rural Honduras, out in the western part of Honduras. It's difficult to recruit to that. So we had that discussion. So Marco married a female Honduran who trained in Germany, who's a German-trained ophthalmologist. So he went out and boarded one, married one, now has a baby with her. Pablo <laughs> just had his baby with a Colombian ophthalmologist. Uh, so now we've got five ophthalmologists and we're growing the third generation. Wow. And so they do things differently, but they make sense. They, they make sense in their environment. And it's really, it's really amazing to see and the relationships we have with them. They're all in a handshake. That, um, we have a clear discussion about what we're going to do. We agree to it and everybody sticks to it. There's no real question. If there's any question, we talk about it. We move on. We've had to now memorialize our uh, relationships because of our partnering with U.S. companies. Sure. U.S. companies don't like handshakes. <laughs> they said, you can't work with us if you work on a handshake. You have you to have a contract. Yeah. I said, okay, we'll do it for you, but recognize we're not doing it for ourselves. Well, that's fantastic. And well, that, that, that family's dinner table, man, that discussion must be pure ophthalmology. You know, they're very, they're very well read, very interesting people. You know, they're, yeah. uh, they talk about ophthalmology, but sometimes it's just, they talk about whatever. Yeah, for sure. Now, how often are you getting down to Central America? Once or twice a month. Wow, so you're doing a lot. You're there probably half half your week. Uh, half a month. Yeah, and my ideal trip is about five days. It's about a day down. I'm there two or three days and a day back. Now, I am on the phone or WhatsApp. It's really, you know, I don't do uh, FaceTime, but WhatsApp has fundamentally changed what I can do in the developing world. We have, sure. we have free cell phone. We've got text video, whatever. So I do consults all week with them. Less and less now that I've taught them, you know, I've been teaching them for 10 years, but we're always adding new skills. So we've got 10 people on the research team in Honduras that are not the docs, they're just employees to handle all the paperwork and all that stuff. And it took us a couple of years to bring people in to get them trained. They have had about a hundred hours of classroom lectures on site mm -hmm. to get their skills up to the level that we want to be. So I'm on site once or twice a month, but I'm available all, all week long. And same with Vukic. Uh, John Vukic is my U.S. partner. That it, it got to be there was so much opportunity and so much to be done. I couldn't do it myself. So back in 
2016 or so, John and I started working together, and that's that's been an amazing uh, relationship as well to be part of this kind of growing process. Wow, We've fantastic. Got, yeah. So, you know, it all started, you know, with, with uh, seeking a challenge, trying to understand our profession. You know, I love what we do. And... I really, really wanted to get better at it. So I graduated from residency in 91. I was an okay cataract surgeon. I wasn't great. And I busted my ass for years to get better. And so the things that helped me get better was research because you get feedback. You get really honest, brutal feedback. Right. And in America, there's nothing like looking the patient in the eye the next day after surgery, it either worked or it didn't. And those two things pressured me to be the best I could be, and they helped drive. And so one of the things I would encourage your readers or listeners to think about is develop a passion to judge yourself in a way that you're comfortable with to help mm -hmm. drive you to get better. You know, cataractcoach.com is a great name. What most people, I, well, I would suggest for probably just about everybody needs is a cataract coach, a personal sure. cataract coach, because no matter how good you are, you can always get a little bit better. Right. And it's really hard to do that without a coach. I mean, people that are professionals at whatever frequently have coaches. They don't give up coaching because they turn pro. They just have more expensive coaches. <laughs> That's true. And so... I've also had a career of helping U.S. surgeons uh, try to get better. And over the last 30 years, there's been a change in, you know, how the, who we selected in ophthalmology. You know, they're always just exceptional people. But we tend to make them a little bit um, a little bit brittle. It's hard to cr effectively, comfortably criticize some of the newer graduates because they've never really felt that criticism. You know, they come from the generation that has everybody that goes to the birthday party gets a present. Yeah, everybody, participation every, trophies. Everybody in the in the bowling league got a trophy, some smaller, some bigger. You know, that's how what we did. And I saw that, and that's how I raised my kids. Um, but, you know, in, in the era of the 90s, when somebody graduated, they were expected to work more than 40 hours a week. Right. And they were expected to get chewed out if they didn't do it just right. And I remember thanking some of my faculty who chewed me out pretty good for screwing up. Thank you for giving me your honest opinion. You know, I don't enjoy it, but I'm going to get better from it. And so I appreciate it. Right. And I think that one of the things we've lost in today's training, and not just in ophthalmology, but in all of healthcare, is the ability to criticize somebody comfortably and in a constructive way. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage your listeners to sit, find somebody who's going to criticize them in a constructive, private way to help them get better. Because that's really how you get better. You rarely get better because somebody said, add a boy or add a girl. You get better usually because something bad happened and you learn from it. Right. Absolutely. So seek out those opportunities. Don't miss those opportunities. You don't have to do it publicly. But find somebody that's going to help you in that way, and you'll get better faster. No, those are such great points. I mean – even just a baseline thing, if you're operating, even let's say you're in the first few years of practice and you don't have anyone else around you, video record your surgeries, record that game day footage, go home, watch your video again and ask yourself, now, mm, what am I doing okay here and what could be improved? Absolutely. And, you know, I was kind of the first generation of ophthalmologists that had that benefit. I used to spend my lunch money buying videos from Howard Gimbel. Mm -hmm. He would record his surgeries. He's such an amazing surgeon. I would spend 10 bucks, 20 bucks when I had it as a resident and get some of his videos and I'd watch them. 
and watch him and learn from him. And I got better. And it was one of the greatest thrills of my life when I actually was on a podium with Howard Gimbel once, many years later. <laughs> yeah, I, described it, so I used to spend my lunch money buying your videos. They were awesome. I got to be a better surgeon because of what you showed me. Right. And there's it, cataract coach or other things are available now that can do that. But I, I get the impression that people think that they've already conquered that world. You know, when they graduate from residency, they seem like, okay, I'm good. But you really got your driver's permit. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. I, I say that one of the most naive things that I ever said, one of the stupidest things I ever said was when I was a senior resident and I said to myself, I can't wait till I'm in practice. It'll be so much easier. And of course, it's laughable because it's so much harder. Yeah, you're, that's a great way of putting it. When you finish residency, now you've done, you're graduated, you're an attending, you have your board certification, that's your learner's permit. Now you're getting started. Well, and I used to be part of a very good practice in Indianapolis, uh, Ice Surgeons of Indiana. And our claim to fame was we worked harder than everybody else. We were all really good surgeons, but we worked harder at CE. We worked harder at patient care. And we would have young docs come into the, into the marketplace in Indiana. And they would tell the local reps, this is, we're going to outwork eye surgeons. Mm -hmm. And they, the direction said, good luck with that. <laughs> and, you know, every year after year after year, we would outwork them because, you know, I'm not the smartest ophthalmologist in the world, but I can work harder than the smart, smartest ophthalmologist in the world. So ultimately, I'm going to get more done. Right. And so what we are challenged with as a profession is ophthalmologists as a group are an amazing group of individuals. You know, they're academically comp accomplished. They're generally nice people. Um, but our, our Achilles tendon is we think that's enough. Mm -hmm. You still can't replace hard work. Right. At some point, you got to do the hard work. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, arguably, the hard work is better than being, you know, a genius. Hard work actually gets the work done. Yeah, so, you know, I think that there's all sorts of opportunities for younger ophthalmologists these days, but it requires some extra effort. You know, one of the things that, People asked me, said, what would you do different? Yeah. And I said, I wouldn't do a thing different. I just want to do it again. I said, my biggest desire in life is to be a 30-year-old graduate of an ophthalmology program one more time. I just want yeah. to do it all again. I want to do the failures. I want to do the successes. I want to do it all one more time. I just wish I could do that. I don't get to do that. But that's my wish is it was such an amazing ride. The climb to become a better surgeon was so rewarding. It was worth all the right. extra effort for me. And my yeah. hope is that all these younger docs have that same experience. I hope that they can get to the plateau that they want to get to and understand that it's okay to get roughed up along the way. It's part of the process. It's a learning process. That's how you learn. That's how you get better. It can't be an easy road. I mean, think about how many times dad talked to you. You know, there's the, of course, the congratulatory conversation, which we forget. But there's that conversation where dad talked to you about dad's a little disappointed and, you know, something you did, whatever that may be. And you remember those conversations and you don't want to have them again. <laughs> That's so true. You know, I, uh, I was a really good chess player when I was younger. And one of my goals in life was to beat my dad in chess. I was 13 years old when I did that. And my dad almost never played chess with me again. I said, why don't you play chess? Again? I don't need to. You've learned that lesson. Go learn some other lessons. Oh, nice. And he taught me a lot of things that way that it was like, I'm an idiot. Okay, I'll, I'll learn from that. One, 
One of my favorites is my, I have a younger brother who's four years younger. We get along great. But when I was a teenager and I thought I knew everything, my dad gave me the job of teaching my brother something. And I was kind of tardy doing it. I said, Dad, he's so slow. I don't want to, I don't want to waste my time teaching. I said, okay, but think about that the next time you want me to teach you something. Mm -hmm. I said, if you don't take the time to teach your brother, who's going to take the time to teach you? Right. Okay, Dad. Well, he, he and I had that conversation 50 years ago. I still remember like it was yesterday. Yeah, well, that's such a great lesson. For sure. Yeah, I also feel like you that I, I'm kind of a little sad that I'm, I'm mid-career. <laughs> I kind of wish I was back at the beginning of my career. Like you said, you're in your early 30s and like that excitement of learning every case and getting better and better. And that was a fun time. It really was. It was amazing. I mean, I, in the 90s, I loved going to meetings because there was so much to learn. I right. would just walk through the, the floor and just, wow, look at that, look at that. I mean, it was just amazing. And I'd go home and my job, I would try to, at first, learn one new thing a year. Because anything, anything faster than that was overwhelming. Well, 10 years later, I'm trying to limit it to one thing a month. Right. Because <laughs> I'm learning so fast. I'm like, right. come on, I only want to do one a month. I couldn't do that. I was learning, you know, something every week. Right, for sure. And it, it was so enriching. You know, um, so a, a great phrase that I think I didn't learn until later in my career was it's nourishing. You know, a, 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 we're in a profession that is so nourishing. When the little old lady says, hey, Dr. Waltz, can I give you a hug? I'm just seeing so great. I just want to show you how great I'm seeing. And she doesn't show me with her vision. She shows me with her touch. Yeah. And, you know, what a gift that is for all of us to be able to experience that. I'm sure every ophthalmologist out there experiences that. And it's so, such an amazing gift that our patients give us back. You're right. Absolutely. It's so gratifying to do what we do. Um, like you, I'm thankful every day that I'm an ophthalmologist. It really is such a blessing. Yeah. And so I'm very hopeful for our profession and our current generation of ophthalmologists out there, you know, they, I'm jealous. They're on, yeah. a, they're on a journey for the next decades that you just can't describe. Yep. And that's a great way to sum this up for all our young listeners. Cause we have our audience skews on the younger side, thirties and forties is probably most of it. Enjoy this time. Kevin is absolutely right. I also yearn for the days when I was learning something new all the time and ramping up that knowledge. And I try to keep up now, but it's just a little bit different. Totally agree. I enjoy it now, but part of it is, part of what drove my learning was fear. Sure. You know, ophthalmologists are all about success. And so part of success is fear of failure. So as I learned that I had to accept failure in order to get better, the success was a little bit less exciting mm -hmm. because I wasn't afraid of failure as much. Still afraid, but not as much. And so it's really great to go into a day of surgery and know that you don't have any fears. Right. It, it, you're going to make it work one way or the other. You're not sure how, but you've worked at it hard enough now. You know you're going to be okay. And what kind of training does it take to a surgeon to get to the point and say, I'm going to stick a needle and a blade in 20 eyes today, and they're all going to be happy I did it. Right? You got a, a professional basketball player who shoots 93% from the free throw line. You think, wow, so good. We've got about 100. We've got about 1,000. We have to be 100%. Every day. And that, it takes a while. 
takes a while yeah. and effort to get there. But you're right. Half the fun, though, is the journey getting there, not just getting there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's great that when you can share it with your partners. You know, Go if on. you've got some colleagues, whether they're in your practice or just friends, it's fun to share it with somebody who's going through the same process. You know, I loved it when I was a resident, sharing that with my fellow residents. I loved it coming out into practice, uh, sharing with my partners. And you developed a trust in that way that was profound. For sure. And that was part of the gift too. Yeah, that's all amazing stuff. Well, Kevin, I want to tell you, thank you for chatting with us, giving us some insight. You're doing some amazing work in South America, work that not only benefits those patients, but boy, it brings that technology to us so that we here in the U.S. as surgeons can benefit from the work you're doing too. Thank you. It's a, it's a great privilege and an honor, and I, I really enjoy everything you do, Dave. Thank you. Thank you for enjoying that podcast with me, and I trust that you learned a lot. Please remember to click like and subscribe to our videos and our podcast. And please tell your friends. They're available on Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, YouTube, cataractcoach.com, everywhere else you can find podcasts. And it's for video and audio. And I'd like to have a comment from you. Please leave me a comment below. Let me know how you're liking the podcast. And also give some suggestions for future guests. And we'll catch you next time.